ready to Good. start. Black and All right. So blended family playbook have an awesome, awesome, awesome friend, great leader. Um, you got to follow him. He can only be on for 45 minutes because he has to get with his team for an accountability call in 45 minutes. So we're starting a little early this time, but guess what? You're going to be able to watch this on the rebroadcast and we want you to share this, share it often. Sharing is caring. I have none other than Dr. Rob McClellan on Facebook Live with us. Why don't you tell everybody, hello, Rob. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, huge Marcus fan to, to be on the show anyway. I can serve you. It's good. So much respect for you, bro. Hey, I, uh, same good. here. Same here. So quick background on how I met Rob. Me and Rob were part of the, wow, one of the initial certification programs for the John Maxwell um, leadership coaching mentorship program and we're, we're both founding partners um i believe rob uh at this point in in his life i'm hoping um to to get to his level because this guy is a bastion of leadership wisdom knowledge and um the reason why rob has always resonated with me is he's a straight shooter Rob will challenge you, whether you are a friend of 30 years, 40 years, or if he's just met you. And that's you don't find that kind of peer leadership because he wants people to get better, whether, again, he knows you as a friend or he knows you as an acquaintance. He wants you to get better. So he has some really great information he's going to share. And if you want to follow Rob, I'm going to give you a link right now where you can follow him. And if you go ahead and subscribe to Leader Tribe, that is his that is his organization. I'm going to tell you, you're going to get three free executive summaries from some amazing men. Um, these executive summaries, again, free to you. All you have to do is join. So I'm going to put it across the ticker tape right now. And I'm just going to let that I'm just going to let that just kind of flow across the screen. But L, it's right here. It's right here. It's coming you can see that. So let's get going. Let's get to it, right? Let's get to it. So Rob, give us a little background about yourself, where you're from, married, family, uh, those types of things. Go ahead and share with the, the Facebook family. I will. Some of this will be new to you, Marcus, even though I've uh, grown our friendship so much over the years. But one of the reasons, even when I do my corporate uh, consulting, and that's uh, you know my day job, I get to work with some unbelievable multi, 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 multi million dollar uh, companies. Uh, and I get to work with the guys in the C-suite uh, or the ladies in the C-suite as the case may be. So that would be your CEO, CFO, chief operational officer, of those people, because I work at the very top of corporations and organizational alignment. And I am known as the unvarnished purveyor of truth. And so That's you know what? I come in and I just shoot it straight and I go, hey, if you want to fire me, it would be the greatest day of my life. But until then, it looks like reality here. <laughs> I can hear you say, I can picture you saying yeah, that. That's exactly what I say. And, and so what you don't know is why that's so important to me. It's because I grew up um, a young man who was so full of myself. And all I was doing is lying all the time to try to get girls to go out with me or to look better than I was to... Um, somehow be impressive in ways that I wasn't. And so I was the biggest liar that I'm aware of. And, uh, and then I became a person of faith. I heard that there was a God who could even love someone like me. I thought, no, 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 no. Once you know me, I had to live with myself at night, laying in bed going, nobody could love someone like me. And it was hard to believe because my mom was married and divorced four times by the time I was in sixth grade, probably some more after that. Different guy in the house every night when the bars closed. So I didn't experience love as a little kid like a lot of people do. And so I kind of looked at myself as unlovable. So I was just killing it in sports and some uh, other things, but I was just lying, lying. When I came to the realization that even somebody like me could be loved and forgiven, it changed my entire life. And one of the very first things I thought of is, okay, I got to stop lying. Well, I kind of went to the other end of the spectrum. Now I just keep it real all the time. And so that's really what, uh, who knew that that's what was going to be the result, but it has gotten me into some unbelievably great places around the world. And um, 
I just could not be think more thankful that A, I could be forgiven and that B, now I have a daughter. She's 24 years old. Really quick story. I was buying a car. I was at a Lexus dealer and um, getting the car. And we were pretty close on the price. And the gentleman across from me, I had just read the research. And that is that once you're in the store, they do not want to let you off the lot. That's the worst thing in their life because they think as soon as you go off the lot that you're going to go somewhere else and buy a car. So I knew his job was to keep me on the lot. Well, I knew how much he had in his car. I had done my research. And so I'm talking to him and I finally said, okay, Pat, hey, hold on real quick. Um, here's the price I'm willing to pay today. And if you don't uh, walk out there and pretend like you're talking to your manager or whatever you're going to do and then come back in, <clears throat> if the very first words out of your mouth when you walk in that door aren't congratulations, Dr. McClellan, I said, then you and I will still be friends. I might even still buy a car from you, but it will not be today. I'm telling you, it w I will not do it today if those aren't the first words when you walk back in. He looks at me and he says, so Dr. Rob, you're sitting here telling me that if I walk back in and we're only $1,000 apart, you're going to let a car like that go for $1,000? And I said, I'll tell you what, um, this is my daughter, Kaylee. I'm going to let her answer that question. So my daughter, she's about 11 at the time. She looks at, uh, up at him and she goes, um, Mr. Pat, my dad says, let your yes be yes and your no be no and all else is of evil. And he will not tell a lie no matter what. And so if I were you, I would believe him. And I looked back at the dude and I said this, I said, this little girl's 11 years old. She has not once ever heard her dad tell a lie. Do you think I'm going to start telling a lie over a stupid thousand dollars? I said, you decide. Mm -hmm. He walks out the door, turns around, walks back in, goes, congratulations, Dr. McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> it was so much fun. And so, you know what? Uh, I am committed to just being an unvarnished purveyor of truth, and it's working for me. I uh, grew up in Northern California, really rough childhood, but no one told me it was rough. You know, it was a bad childhood, but I didn't know. It was the only childhood I knew. And so apparently I was supposed to be sad or depressed or something, but it never took, you know. And uh, and when I uh, came to faith, it was my, right in the very beginning of college, totally turned my life around. For the first time, I was in studying hard now. I wasn't trying to cheat on my tests, things like that. And I had no idea that I had such a aptitude for learning and I fell in love with learning. I committed to becoming a lifetime learner, ended up uh, doing great there. Some other people came along, businessmen, they go, why don't you go back and get more schooling? You're good at that. And I said, you guys, you know, I'm newly married. We got a little kid. And they said, hey, we'll pay for it. So who's ever heard of somebody who said, we'll come along, we'll pay for you to be our master's. So I ended up doing the master's, ended up top of my class. And those same guys, uh, they said, what are you going to do next? I said, I got two great job opportunities. But my uh, other guy, he wants me to go ahead and uh, go on and do some PhD work. And they said, so why don't you do that? I was like, yeah, no, nah, that's a lot of money. And I said, we'll pay for it. And so I went on, I did PhD work, ended up top of my class there. And I just love to learn. And so my PhD is actually in organizational leadership when, uh, when I talk to guys like you. I just want to assure you, you can ask my wife, I am totally not impressed with myself. Uh, <laughs> my friend, John Booker, who's a movie maker in Hollywood, he goes, PhD, yeah, um, piled higher and deeper. And that's kind of where I am, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, dude, I, I own that, you know, that's fine. Here's what I do know. I love to learn and keep learning, and I love to help the organizations uh, that I work with keep getting better and better. And so... Uh, married now for 34 years to the love of my life, Dawn. Uh, the one daughter, Kaylee, uh, she went off the rails for about five years and just made some horrible decisions in life, got herself in a bunch of trouble. And so five years of prayer later, about two months, she came back 180 percent, 180 degree turn. And she is doing great now. She's killing it. I've talked to her two or three times today. And uh, and so I uh, just couldn't be happier. Life is really good with us. Live uh, outside of Atlanta. And uh, since I've started Leader Tribe, that's opened up a bunch of other opportunities. So life's pretty good. Awesome. Wow. So I, I think this is this is so key. It's the transparency. Right. Um, I think a lot of parents sometimes are wondering, you know, my child is is not doing 
And, and it's not about what we think they should be doing. It's not the path that we think they should be leading, but sometimes they have to have that Damascus road experience. Mm -hmm. and they have to experience it themselves. But when they come back, when they come out of it, it is always such an amazing thing. So I love to hear that because um, me and my daughter, um, like I said, I, I we try to talk or she'll call me. Sometimes I'm in meetings. Yeah. She's 25. Sometimes she's like, Dad, uh, did you forget about me? I said, well, no, babe, I, I have a job. I, I, I just <laughs> out of a, a client meeting. But what I love is she loves to call me. She loves to talk to me. And that means so much to me because there was a time um, when it, it was a struggle when you're going through those teenage years and and, and it, it, it was, I'll say, short lived now that I think about it. But it's just so good to hear that, you know, she's she's back walking in her purpose. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, the most beautiful time of all this happened about two months before she came back and she really got in trouble. I mean, she was in jail sometimes and some other things. So she really she did it right when she messed up. And uh, and so she was over at our house. And I said, Boo, I've just got to talk to you. And she goes, Dad, how about if I give the lecture? I go, I don't lecture. What are you talking about? And, uh, and she goes, yeah, you lecture. I said, no, I don't. We have discussions. And she goes, well, how about if I have the discussion? And I said, okay, go. And she said, okay, you and Mom, you love me way more than you did yesterday, but not nearly as much as you're going to tomorrow. But today, your heart is just breaking for me because you love me so much and you know I'm making really bad choices. And you're just saying, is there anything you can do to help me repent? Because you'll help me with anything. But it's ultimately my decision because I'm an adult and you're going to treat me like one. But you love me so much. All you want to know is what can you do? And dad, there's nothing. I'm choosing to keep going the lifestyle. And I'm just crying at this point. And the reason is because she knows how much she's loved. And as soon as she's got, then I, I got nothing else to say. She knows she's loved. She knows she's, it's, it's a unconditional. It's not I'll love you if, or I'll love you when. It's just, I love you. You're the greatest little girl in the history of the world. What in the world's going on? And so on that day, even though she drove off that night and went back to her horrible lifestyle at the time, it was a happy day for me because look, I know how, she knows how much she's loved and there's going to be a day. And at that years, it had been over a, about uh, not quite five years, four years and 10 months at that time. And I had no idea that the sunshine was just around the corner. And Come on. He's doing That's, great. Isn't it, isn't it, it's awesome. It's yeah. awesome. Um, my, uh, my pastor, Pastor Eric Anderson, um, we both have those same um, stories, right? Mm -hmm. we, have, we have amazing daughters. And me and Eric are blended family. Mm -hmm. uh, fathers, and we love our daughters nonetheless. You wouldn't be able to tell. Most people don't even know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, it's just great to hear that because all of you parents that will listen to this, guys, it's right around the corner. The sunshine is right around the corner, just like Rob was Keep stating. Keep loving them. Keep loving them. I know. I know how hard it is. I've had my my uh, pillow cover stained with tears so many nights. It's okay. You keep loving them no matter what, even though they're driving you crazy. And the sunshine's around the corner. Right around the corner. So, right. Let, let's 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 get to some really good stuff. And, okay. and here's the purpose of why I wanted Rob on the show. All right, F blended family. This is why Rob is going to be able to teach you some things. And this is why I want you to follow him. All right. Um, again, there's three free resources you get when you follow him. And I'm going to put that right here at the bottom. This is great stuff, whether you are a husband uh, in, in corporate America try, to, trying to climb the corporate ladder. Um, if you are um, in a nonprofit or a church and you're a pastor or you're one of the, the lay members, I'm just letting you know, you've got to get and tap into these resources. OK, good stuff. So, so Rob, let's. And this is why I want to talk to you because I like having people that are transparent on my show that can help other people in what you've done and learned over the past, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. You're going to be able to say it and deliver them from their experience that is somewhat similar mm -hmm. in, a, in a shorter time frame. That's what helping and leading and influencing is all about. It's what loving people is all about. So, um, let's get to it. So, 
I, I, this is one question I've always wanted to ask you, and we touched on it yesterday when we were talking. How is it that you are so well versed and comfortable in, um, I'll, I'll say, multicultural settings? Mm -hmm. um, Rob, I, it, it's it's one it's it's a genuineness that I noticed uh, back in 2011 when we first met. Mm -hmm. It was something that draws people to you, and it's whether you're you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You have this, this ability to, um, you, and, and guys, if you're following Rob on Facebook or you're following him um, via Leader Tribe, you'll notice that there is a multicultural aspect, which in my opinion is how it should be. If we're Christians, there should be mu intentional multicultural inclusion. Rob, how, how did you come upon that? I, I mean, I, I don't I would assume it's not natural. It was something that you had to work on uh, based on environment. But go ahead and share that with us. Yeah, um, I'm at the place today. The uh, church I attend here in Atlanta is the most multicultural church that we're aware of in the world. Um, might not be, but we had 140 nations with us this morning. So, I mean, what are you going to do with that? It's like heaven when you walk in. So it's a church of about 16,000, and uh, I've been overseeing our Midtown campus. Uh, I'm a, a board member, a businessman, an entrepreneur. I'm on the board of the church, and uh, we have this incredible young pastor who was going to launch the Midtown campus, and right before it launched, uh, his wife uh, got uh, cancer and died. And it was most, the saddest thing ever. So they uh, kind of brought him back to the main campus. Well, my wife and I had already started going down there, learning to set up the nursery. Our whole deal was, hey, we're going to be the old people who go down and outwork all the young people. And then we uh, buy Starbucks for them to put burning coals on their head, you know. And so we're up in the morning at 530 down at the campus by six on our hands and knees setting up the nursery every morning. When that happens, my pastor said, Hey Rob, would you uh, would you consider pastoring that campus? And I told my pastor who I love and I'll do anything for. I said, Yeah, pastor, uh, that would be a no. And he goes, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and I said, he goes, No, I'm serious. I said, Me too. I'm a businessman, an entrepreneur. Are you are you are you saying leave your calling in that and be called to be a pastor? And 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 I because I'm one of the most active guys I know in my church, but it's only because I believe in it so much. And uh, and I said, or are you really thinking, hey, we need somebody know, who knows how to lead organizations, get in there, hire and fire and keep it really healthy for He goes, yeah, that. I said, well, how about if I give you two or three months? He said, well, how about three or four? And I said, okay, well, that was 18 months ago. Wow. And today was the day we handed it over to new leadership. And so my wife and, and I have been down there. Well, just in our church, it is the average person in there isn't Caucasian, um, but we have, I mean, this incredible mix. Every Wednesday night in our home, we have a small group included in our small group, believe it or not, we got black, white, Hispanic, Asian, and Middle Eastern. Oh, my God. Every, I know, it's, it's unbelievable. And so I don't know what we've done to attract that, but we are citizens of the world, and we're so into this thing that um, there is only one race, and that's the human race. And I am going to love my brother and love my sister. And sometimes they don't love me back, but they can't out love. No one can out love me. And my heart has been so changed that I think I have such a love for people, especially people who for some reason have um, not been treated well in the past. I want them to let them know that's never going to happen around me. And somehow that comes across genuine and it is genuine. And so uh, it works. But uh, where it really started was way back in the day, in, uh, in my high school, I was one of only four white guys on the basketball team. And so I didn't know there was any such thing as racism. I didn't know there was any such thing as prejudice. I also didn't know there was any such thing as playing time because I was on the bench. All <laughs> That's beside <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, But in our group, I mean, we just we had our music and our stuff and we were on the bus going to away games and we're all dancing together. And I really did not know that there was any such thing as, as people who had prejudged through prejudice, prejudged other people just on the color of their skin. And so all of a sudden, it's, it's a couple years later, I'm out in New Jersey. And this is the story I told you. I walk into a store and all of the checkers in the grocery store are all white. 
and all of the bad persons are uh, black. Well, I look at that and I'm like, hey, you can't do that. This is America. What are you doing here? So I demanded to go talk to the general manager. I'm up there going, hey, look at this. This is not, this is a myth. The black people are going like, shut up. Would you shut up? We, you know, we want our jobs here and stuff. But I had never seen that. And so that shows you how out of touch I was. But it was because I came from an environment that really embraced me just for who I was. And it's because I came from the very, very poor side of town. And in our town, there were two high schools in our town, the big, nice, rich, white high school, and then the other high school. I was in the other. And in that, uh, we, were, we just became who we became based on who you were. Now, ultimately, it wasn't the, I don't wanna make it sound better than it was because most people in high school, especially if they haven't heard that they can be loved themselves, they're gonna base their manliness or their self-worth if you're a guy on sexual conquest or how much money you have or how popular you are. And so you're always trying to look better than you are in those particular areas. And certainly that was my story because you haven't learned about who you really want to be on the inside. And all three of those end up being very shallow. One of the things I teach in Leader Tribe is, did you know more millionaires per capita commit suicide than people on welfare? So we know money isn't the answer to life. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't help you and it's not good, and, uh, but at the same time, if you are thinking my whole life is centered around making money, oh, I feel so sorry for you. You're gonna miss out on some of the most beautiful things in life, including being around people of other backgrounds, faith backgrounds, economic backgrounds, everything else. And so I came out of that, I went to college. To me, I would go up and I'd see people, I'd just start talking to them, we'd be good. And all my white friends would be like, well, how, how do you know that guy? I'm like, well, I just met him. And they're like, well, why did you just go up to him like that? I'm like, well, because it was he was interesting. Do you hear what he was talking about? And it was just like, come on, people. Let's, you know, it, when you stay in your own segregated little groups, you miss out on so much of life. And so I made it, I was very, very intentional in that. Um, then I had the privilege of leading a college campus in Washington, D.C., it was with uh, Nyack College. It was one of their campuses. And Nyack was the most intentional college I've ever heard about true uh, reconciliation. And I'll tell you how it happened. Everybody goes, oh, we love everyone, right? Oh, we're great. We're all in this together. Let's hold hands. This is great. But in the cafeteria, go ahead one day and change. The menu on Thursdays is now only Korean food. And you find out how much you like reconciliation. Oh, we love it when everyone's eating our food all the time, right? But all of a sudden you started eating different culture and that's what the college, we were so committed to it. That's what we would do uh, at, up at the New York campus. And it just forced this thing. And all of a sudden these people who didn't like it, they're like, could you imagine living in a culture where that happens to you every day? And it brought a, just the food brought a whole new level of recognition. Well, in that um, and being able to, to lead a, a primarily minority campus in Washington, DC and the, uh, becoming friends with the leaders of that community at the highest levels and find out they weren't really used to trusting white people either, but uh, made these brotherhoods that last with me today, some of my dearest Facebook friends and others, uh, they come from that time. And so that's always just been a part now of who I am. If I had to go to anywhere and it was only one race, I, I'm not gonna make it. I'm just not gonna make it. We gotta, because I'd be still so sorry for those people. It's like, come on, let's get out. Let's explore the world. So. It's just part of who I am now. This is, um, I, I think this is really such a, a great discussion. So Rob, I'm gonna ask you for, and, and, and I've seen this and, and me and you both know, um, I've heard the, well, can, can a black person be racist? Absolutely, mm -hmm. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. um, can, a, can anybody be racist against another race? It, sometimes their own people, yes. Mm -hmm. But Rob, how do you help somebody and, and kind of guide them along when they've really only been in the, the microcosm of their culture? Mm -hmm. How do you help them along? Because that can be difficult subconsciously, right? They, they just, they might be oblivious to it. How yeah, do you- have no idea how it is. And then all of a sudden you do something like change the food up and they're saying, no, I love everybody. Uh, yeah, but um, I don't want, them imposing on me what I've been imposing on them all their life. That's a whole different thing right there. You know? Ooh, that's some good stuff. Yeah, crazy. Um, it, it, it is. Um, 
So I think uh, to help them, one of the things you have to do is, is part of it's education. And, and what I hear is all these other people saying, hey, it's just all education. It's not all education because education changes the head, but it doesn't change the heart. And what I find is so often some of the hurt or the pain or those things have gone down to the, to the heart level. And, uh, and it's just uh, to see if I've been hurt at the heart level, then I'm not open to learning. I'm not open to getting out of my bubble and stuff. And so often you have to deal with, the, with kind of the heart level. And you just have to ask open-ended questions to find out why people are really there. And often you'll, they'll hear themselves talk and they'll say things like, you know what, I, I, I know even as I'm saying this, it's not right, but here's how I feel. And I said, well, you said it's not right. Tell me about that. What, what's not right about it? Well, if it's not right, why are you starting to think that way? Why are you starting to feel that way? And so allow them to go on this journey. And then once they're at that place of being teachable, then you say, well, if somebody were to come along and give you an opportunity to begin to make progress in that area, would you be open? And then you just start giving them some opportunities to be exposed to some awesome people from around the world. And, you know, with us, it's really easy to say, show up on Wednesday nights. Uh, this our small group's grown to the place that now we're going to have, and you'll love this as a leadership guy. Uh, the Lord's blessed us with the big house. You know what it was? We used to live in California. Little teeny house in California. That. We moved to Atlanta. It's unbelievable how far California money goes in the South, right? That right. It does. And so if we come out here with our little teeny house money in California, and we built a mansion. It's awesome. It's not a mansion, but it's a cool house. Um <laughs> And so one of the things we did is thought we want to have so many people over so we can love them. So we have our small group. Well, now we're having two small groups meet in our house on the same night, okay, because we got parking and everything. So they'll come in. They'll have two different small group leaders. They'll meet in different parts of the house. So we'll get together in the beginning, do a little lesson, but then they go into their small group time for an hour. Then they come back, and we'll all fellowship and eat together because, um, to me, it's all about the food, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> And so now you got all these people coming back, and most of them come just because they want that intercultural mix, that reconciled, this, I, I, I love you, I don't know you that well, help me learn to love you, what does that mean to you? And so it's really quite a group where once that people get that bug, they can't stay away. And here's the other part that you'll love is the leadership part. Um, you know, we have two leaders for the two groups. Neither of those are me or my wife. And so you say, oh, you're just the host? No, no, no. We found another couple to be the host. We just happen to have the house. They show up. We don't even host it. We got other people doing that. We jump in and we're part of the group. And when we're not here, they know our garage code. The whole group meets anyway. Bob, this is, um, I've got to get you and um, Pastor Eric together because we, me and him might need to take a trip out to Atlanta mm -hmm. to visit the church. Um, we're getting ready to start small groups at our church. Mm -hmm. And his his last, I believe, three sermons on Sunday have been about fellowship and how it needs to happen over food. It, it, that's how they did it back in the Bible. Right. I mean, it was they broke bread, communed, community was enriched. It was it was it was done over at a table, you know, with, with food. So have you ever uh, heard of the Food Network program, Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives? Have you ever you seen know, Yes, my amazing mother, who's a great cook, uh, my, Crystal's mom, my wife's mom is a great cook. She turned me on to that show. Okay, so check it out. I've eaten at over 200 of the restaurants from that show. So 200, bro, serious. Because I travel all the time, right? And so like I'll be in Dallas next week. Well, you know, there's actually 11 of them in the greater Dallas area. Well, I got to go eat dinner and lunch somewhere. So I call up the owners. I watch the episode really quick because I, I got a flavortown.com. You can... <laughs> find wherever you are there's a map on there and you click on it and you'll see the little six minute episode and they'll say when Jim and Beth opened this joint in 19 you know and so I'll just call them and go like uh, yes may speak with Jim or Beth please and they're like uh, yeah who's calling I'm like I pull out the PhD I go uh, Dr. McClellan <laughs> and then they're like uh, yeah hold on I'm like hey you guys I saw you on TV you're like rock stars I'm going to be there tomorrow night is there any chance you're going to be there I'd like to meet well, now you're eating at the table with the owners of the restaurant. Bro, that's a whole different experience right there. And so I, I just started doing it. And so I got the hookup, man, at all these eateries all over the United States. It's a lot of fun. That's awesome. I, I can't wait to tell um, 
my mom that because that's going to blow her awake. Now you got me thinking um, next week when you're in Dallas, let's make sure to uh, connect because I'll be in Dallas next week. So depending on when you're there, hopefully we can um, go to one of those diners. Yeah, love it. I will be there Thursday is my best day, Wednesday night or Thursday of next week. Thursday night would probably be best. Okay, let's um let me see if I can work. I need to look on my calendar. I believe I'll be there Wednesday or Thursday. I'm there about every other week. So, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. one of my uh, biggest clients is a. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, I know we're nearing. We got about about twelve minutes left. Here's what I want. Okay. Here's the, the meat of the good stuff that I know you can bring. What are your top three? points, uh, most important points when it comes to managing burnout, when it comes to family, career, relationships, what have you done to keep your family intact in times of, of extreme trouble slash trauma? And what is the best advice you could give to a young person that is getting ready to start you know, their career, their life, their journey, those three things. Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, <clears throat> when I do Leader Tribe, I have what's called an avatar, and that's the person I think that I'm talking to out there in radio land, and who is that person? And I've developed it, and it's a, a 38-year-old dude who uh, drives about 20 minutes to get into work. He works all day, and he works with a company that um, helps other companies invest in bond portfolio. I just made it up, I mean, right? But then he goes home at night. He usually listens to news on the way in, but sports on the way home. But by the time he gets home, he realizes, I got a wife and I, I got a kid. And guess what? Surprise, another one on the way. And my wife's got an older minivan. And if I could just move up into senior management, I could get her a nicer one. And her parents would be more. And he's still concerned about how am I going to impress her parents? How am I going to take care of her? Here's the only problem. He's now about 20 pounds over the weight. He's not eating right. And he's just going... I don't know if I can do this because he doesn't have the energy to take care of himself anymore. And so I've got in my mind when I'm talking on all my social media, I've got someone in mind who's just about to burn out if he's not careful. So I love this topic. And the reason I chose that person is I think there are so many of us who are right there. I mean, we're doing it and we're showing up and we're doing it right. But over and over again, you think, how much longer can I keep doing this? And in our minds, what we're thinking is, can I just catch a break? But then we meet all these other people and, and it doesn't matter. They're working as hard as we are, but they seem to not be burning out and they still are joyful and they're handling it well. And you're like, what's going on? How did they build the kind of margin into their life that really is the, uh, the, the key? And so one of the, the very first thing I'd say is it is a partnership. Uh, when I was at my very lowest point, I had been fired from a job. I'd actually been accused of some things that weren't true. And But the people had stood up in front of a bunch of other people I cared about and said, oh, yeah, these are true, and he's confessed to it. And it wasn't even true. Okay, so I'm devastated, right? I hear about this. I am laying on the floor in our living room. All I remember is how bad the carpet smelled. So that's how, you know, I just kind of head down. My wife comes over, and I, back then I had hair, and she's just kind of moving my hair out of the way, and she's just kind of humming and singing over me. And she goes, there's going to be a better day. And you need to know I'm going to be with you now. And I'm going to be with you in the good times as well. And there was something that happened to me in that moment where you go, where do you find a wife like that, right? I mean, this is at my lowest. She doesn't even have any income. And it would have been easy for her to say, you better get off that floor and get a job because we need some money up in this house. You know, it wasn't like that at all. And so we've always been there for each other. And I think one of the things that you can do if you're just starting a family or if you're there and you're getting frustrated by your spouse and they know it and you know it. And all of a sudden they're thinking in the middle of my burnout, now I don't have another partner to go to. It's going to be 10 X harder to make, make it through there or to stay out of burnout. If you don't do that, wow. I've got a wife who says, guess what, buddy, um, you're starting to get up. And here's what she says. You're starting to get a little crispy around the edges. I'm not going to go there. And so let's look at your schedule. And I've given her the right to look at my schedule unless it's something that's ultra important. She can cancel a meeting. She can do something like that. And she says, we need to get a day off and just spend some time together and get you away from your phone, away from electronics. And let's just, and so 
Actually, what I'll do is I will call a client and I'll say this. My wife came up to me and said, I'm a little crispy around the edges and I'm not as good for you as I need to be. And I'm not as good for her and our family. And you know what? I think she's right. And so what I'd like to do is take with your permission is to reschedule our meeting for next week because I really want to stay fresh and at my best so I can help you. 100% of the time they're going, you know what? Uh, that sounds great. Um, are you okay? And just to know that I'm in this together with my wife and uh, it, the one of the shames of my life is that I didn't start listening to her earlier Ooh. because she really helps me. And uh, when I when I went through that super hard time and uh, we were going through some marriage counseling and this guy says, uh, uh, Rob, do you know how awesome your wife is? I said, yeah, I know. She goes, he goes, then why don't you listen to her? I go, I do. He goes, no, you don't. He just called me out on it, right? And we're talking about it. And so number one is you've got to be a partner with that spouse. And, and you know what? You're seeing them at their worst. But if you don't partner with them, it's going to get uglier. And so number one, got to be there. Number you know, and, and you have my wife here uh, talking about, um, <laughs> I like her. I like Rob's wife. And, mm-hmm. and you know, it's true. Um, my wife, and, and I'll be honest, um, she really does help me. Mm-hmm. I can be difficult to live with. I try, I'm trying to always get better, but she's the one who will tell me, dude, you're, you need to get it together. You need to slow down. You need to, you know, decompress, whatever. And, and, and I'm so glad I do. I have a woman in my life that is like that. So um, I, I know how you feel. Um, it is a blessing beyond what we would know. And you know what the, greatest privilege is she's not, she doesn't get there as much as I do, but you're a leadership guy. You're a type A, the type A in the relationship always is going to tend towards that more. And they usually have the more overbearing personality. And so if we haven't watched out, if we've kind of uh, um, offended somebody or held them down long enough, then they don't even feel like they have the right to tell us. And, uh, and so uh, for the type A, whoever that is, the man or the woman, I just want to tell you, I want to, I want to look you right in the eye and tell you, hey, you know what? Uh, that person is there for a reason. They're there for a reason. And you can, you can learn to grow and they can help you. But if you keep going the direction you're going to, there's, it's not going to be a good ending. That's a good one. My wife is looking at me um, in, and I can tell in my peripheral, she just stood there and just looked at me and said, yeah, you need to put this 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 one on replay right here at you know at the six twenty five mark. Make sure you're listening to this again and again. So thank you, Rob. thank thank you. I hope my wife is listening because she'll hear all these good things and it'll be a good night in the McClellan household. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is good. This is good. Uh, we hey, we're gonna have to do thing real quick. Yeah, on that is uh, what I would call morning routine. And so just ask your best friend, Google. That's what I tell my leader drivers. Hey, go to your best friend, Google, and say, what's a great morning routine? But all of the most successful people I know have an incredible morning routine where they do the same stupid thing over and over and over again every day. And I know people who they will turn down huge meetings with huge people because the guy will say, hey, can we get together at 7? And the guy's like, yeah, I can't. I can get together after 8. Why? Because he's part of his morning routine. And so if you will Google that, and just Google successful people morning routine. None of it is rocket science, but they get up at about the same time. They drink plenty of water. If they're a Christian, they might pray. They might read some word. They might exercise a little, but they do the same thing every day. And it's something that's improving who they are. And, and so those are the people who ha- now they have a base and they're solid, ready to go through the day. The people who don't have a good morning routine, who get up and all they do Right in the very beginning is work on OPA, other people's agendas. That's all your email is, is OPA. It's let me check my email first thing in the morning. Already you're trying to catch up and return and let me get some of these out of the way so I can have a better day. You're already going to have a bad day. You're already working on other people's agendas. Take as much time in the morning as you can to get your agenda done. And then the rest of the day is going to be a lot better. Oh, that's a, And I think we hear this so often, Rob. I think that is so key for young people to establish that now, as well as older people. I'm so glad my daughter, um, I believe she's listening in. This is something that I'm so glad at the age of 20, 25, my daughter is now understanding 
what leadership is all about. I've given her access to my Amazon Kindle list and mm-hmm. I believe Audible as well. And that morning routine, she's realizing it. Sometimes she'll say, Dad, now her mom doesn't like this, Rob, but C- Camille will tell me, Dad, I'm going off the grid for a couple of weeks. I just need to focus. I, I've been a little out of focus. Dad, I haven't gone anywhere. You know how to find me, but I'm not going to be calling. I got to really focus because uh, just to let you know, Rob, I'm my daughter is a young person. Yeah. Oh, she, she's, um, she's almost maniacally focused. Hmm. And I, I love that about her. She's an entrepreneur, so she has to be focused. She's never worked for corporate America, doesn't want to. She does her own um, things out there. And and, and it's funny, um, I'm so glad she's listening right now because she's doing that. At the age of 25, I wish mm-hmm. I had been doing that like she is. I'd okay. be further along. Um, well, I've, I'm starting two new businesses in the last month and next month that are entrepreneurial businesses, primarily based in the Philippines, doing all the back end. So I love young entrepreneurs. I want to keep challenging them. So have her hit me up in any way I can serve them. I'll, I'll make it happen. Definitely. I, I definitely will. She she um she's heard me talk about you. Um, but I'll, I'll I, guarantee it's not true. I'll say that was vicious rumor. I'm really nice. So. <laughs> no, you're, you're one of the you're one of the good ones. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to going to be doing that. Um, yes, that was that. You know what? I'm actually so glad you said that, because um, I think one of the good books that I, I read that really helped me was The 15 Laws of Invaluable Growth by mm-hmm. John Maxwell. Yeah. One of of just the best books. If you're out there listening, great book. But I also don't want you to forget. Mm-hmm. If you follow Rob right now, I'm going to show it again because we're almost at the end, guys. And Rob has got to go. He's got his tribe that he has his accountability call here in a few short minutes. Great. Hey, Rob. Yeah. Let me look. Let me show you, Rob. Look right here as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know. Right. I know more people who have started a leadership journey after reading that book than any other book. Right here. Um, I, Rob, great book. Mm-hmm. But guys, you got to follow Rob. There are three great resources at no cost to you. If you go to that on the ticker tape right there, I believe it's LDR. Uh-huh. com slash FFF. You got to get there. Um, great resources. Rob, I want to respect your time, your team's time. And here's the thing, Rob, if I didn't want to respect it, you're going to cut me off anyway. Yeah, that's, right. that's the kind of guy you are. Well, and I uh, I do a daily podcast, your daily dose of growth. And, and at the end of every one of those, I go, much love, I'm out. And so that's what I tell you. Hey, Mark, excuse me real quick. Much love, I'm out. <laughs> yes. So guys, uh, and, and here's my mom. She's just uh, right there. That's, that's Crystal's mom, my mom as well. Um, she listens to a minute with Maxwell. Guys, follow Rob. Rob, please tell your tribe, your wife, your family, thank you for giving me the last 45 minutes. We're going to do this again. And I want to have a few more pastors on, leaders on. We're going to just have a, a really dynamic show. But thank you so much. All right. I'm going to let you know. Hey, so much love, bro. Great you talking to you. Hey, love you guys. Any way I can serve you, hit me up, leadertribe.com. It's just rob at leadertribe.com. Again, all those resources, everything I do over there, podcasts, it's all free. I'm only here to help other people get better. And guys, he is. Thanks again, Rob. All, all right. right. We'll talk That's to you later. That's it. Bye-bye. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right. So, hey, Facebook family, Blended Family Tribe, I want you to know we got a really great show coming up in a couple of weeks. This is, I believe, Mental Health Awareness Month. I believe it is. And we're going to have some really, really good people on the show in a couple of weeks. So make sure to join. I'm not going to tell you who they are. We're still building out the guest list, but it's going to be talking about mental health. I don't know if you heard Rob state that more millionaires commit suicide than those are on welfare. So this is not about money. Has nothing to do with money. Mental health has nothing to do with money. Has everything to do with understanding where a person is and the self-awareness that person has. There's so many things and we think that it's a disease and we, th- there's a lot that goes into it. But we need to understand something because one thing that I know is you can't have compassion on some, for someone or anything until you can comprehend it. I want you to remember that you can't have compassion on a thing until you can comprehend 
the thing. You can't have compassion for a person until you understand where they're coming from, where they are, their state of mind. So we're going to work on that this upcoming uh, uh, in a couple of weeks. So make sure to tune in. Thank you. I want you to remember, share this. Sharing is caring. We're going to be back in a couple of weeks. And um, again, thank you. All right. I thank you for joining. Join Strong Blend. Um, let me get that to you. It is right here. Uh, let me put that right there. If you do a search on Facebook under hashtag Strong Blend, you will be able to see that. It'll come up. Hashtag Strong Blend. That's where you get a lot of the materials that we drop that sometimes we're not putting on the normal show. You're going to be able to ask me questions. We are going to start doing polls um, and just really getting your opinion and really starting the conversation. But again, I want to say thank you for joining. If you are looking at me, oh, I can't for that. This <laughs> Okay. All right, Taria. Well, I can't wait either. It's going to be a good one. Um, Man, it's going to be a good show. This one was good. I got to have Dr. Rob back along with Eric, and Pastor Eric Anderson and a few others. Um, this is going to be good. This is going to be good, guys. Also, if you're wondering why I am wearing a Samsung Galaxy 2 shirt, it is because my Samsung Galaxy 2 is just as good as the iPhone X. I said it on this show. iPhone X, iPhone 10. It's just as good as my Samsung too. That's how bad the iPhone experience is for me. So when we document my wife getting a Samsung Note 9, we're gonna show the world that an iPhone user can be converted. Samsung 2 is equivalent to iPhone X. Yes, I said it. I love you guys. Catch you on the flip side of two weeks. Have a great day. Make it intentional. Remember, God, family, career. Now, remember, God, wife, family, career, all that other stuff comes after it. You know, your church responsibilities, those things. But make sure you're keeping your priorities and your value system intact. All right. Love you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good one. Hmm. <sighs>